show you the piano website's down. I'm gonna have to rebuild it from scratch. Are you serious? Yeah, I was messing with you. Doing that. It's not my fault. I know, I was, I was trying to make you feel bad, but <laughs> that ain't happening. Well, I mean, I'm just messing I, I, I'll, I'll get around to it. Just completely. Yeah, I appreciate what you did. Thank you, sir. Did, did it look pretty good? It tore, it tore up real good. It tore, tore up real good. <laughs> hey, brother. All right, Scott, you, you okay? I need to a little bit, okay. Good to see everybody here this morning. This is cold. That wind is there. At least we didn't have any frost last night, I don't think. Wind blew all night. <coughs> Wayne, would you lead us in a word, word of prayer for us again, please? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for such a beautiful morning, a time that we can come together and to open your, your word and apply it to our lives, Father. Father, help us to, to always have that type of heart, that type of attitude towards learning, towards opening up ourselves to you. <laughs> Lord, we just ask you to, to help us in, in doing that. Help us, Father, to, to make the right decisions in life. Father, we pray for those who are unable to be here this morning and that you, you bless them in whatever way that, that they may need uh, blessings, Father. We ask you, Father, to just go with us throughout this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Last week, I think we were in uh, Matthew chapter 26, and Scott, if I was going to talk about the comprehension of the Lord's there's several things in that chapter that I talked about. And one of them, I, I, I did want to mention that just a minute, something about that that, that we, can, we can use in our Bible studies. And you've heard, probably heard me say this before. <laughs> but in, in, uh, anytime I study with somebody and we talk about Acts 2.38, I uh, mentioned the fact that the little word for, or ace, I uh, found out out a long time ago listening to, to a Church of Christ minister debater uh, 
I forget what kind of Baptist, Baptist preacher he was, but, <clears throat> but he was, they were talking about Acts 2.38 and what the little word for meant. And uh, Church of Christ preacher pointed out that the word for in Greek was ace, E-I-S. And if you look it up in, if you've got a Greek-English lexicon, I don't, I don't know uh, Greek, that's for sure, but i got got books that I can look up words and, uh, and that tell me, tell me what they mean. And the little word uh, means for, unto, into. Uh, there's several, several different ways it's used in the New Testament. <laughs> but in uh, on Acts 2.38, it's talking about repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And, and uh, those who teach that you're baptized because your sins have already been forgiven, don't realize what the letter, the little word ace means and what it translated for means. It means that it looks forward. It never looks, ace never looks backward. It always looks forward. Forward to the forgiveness of your sins. For, in English, we know what it means. It means for the forgiveness of sins. <coughs> and as I pointed out before, uh, in the institution, instituting the Lord's Supper, Jesus, after taking the bread and breaking it, said in uh, verse 27, 28, said, for, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Uh, shed for many for the remission of sins. A little word ace, again, pointing out the fact that it's, it looks forward. It looks forward to the forgiveness of sins for the remission of sins. I know of nobody that will deny that, that statement there. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. It means what it says and says what it means. And if, it's, if it means for the remission of sins there, it means the same thing in Acts 2.38. <laughs> Any questions about what we talked about last last week? All right, let's look at John John chapter fourteen. <laughs> I told you uh, one time before that I learned the first several verses of this chapter. I memorized it back when I was about eight or nine year old. My sister, uh, member of the Mount Pisgah Baptist Church, and and I was going some with her uh, there, and uh, we were in class one morning, and the teacher came in, and he said, I, all right, I got a shiny silver dollar for everybody that memorizes uh, John 14. I don't know how many verses there, several of them. Uh, we'll get, get a shiny silver dollar. You got so many weeks to learn it. But when that time come, I was kind of shy and, and uh, bashful to speak up in amongst a lot of people or several people and the class was full of full of children plus the teacher and and nobody raised their hand that they memorized it and i looked around and i didn't raise mine either so i didn't get my shiny silver dollar <laughs> but anyways i still re still remember those uh i don't know that's the first uh eight or ten verses there <coughs> that we were to memorize Anyway, look at, look at this first statement. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. <clears throat> what we've been looking at in the last two or three chapters is the fact that Jesus is leaving. And here in this past chapter, he, talks, he tells them some news that really saddened their hearts. In uh, verse 21, going back to verse 21 in the last chapter, it says, When Jesus had thus said he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Now this, this is a terrible thing to get. He's been trying to tell them that he's leaving them. <coughs> and where he goes, nobody can go. Of course, Peter has a problem with that. But he, he's upset over the fact and troubled over the fact that he's, got the t he's telling them this, but he wants them to know before that when it comes to happen, lest they fall on their face completely. Uh, hadn't had any, he hadn't had a chance to strengthen them in any way, so he didn't, he didn't want to wait till, he, till uh, Judas b betrayed him and wait till uh, Peter denied him, and he 
was going to the cross to be hung there and died. And uh, these, his disciples or his apostles to, to have all that to face. The darkest night in the history of mankind. Nothing ever worse and nothing ever will be worse than the fact the devil and with all his power was at work, as it worked that night. These Jewish leaders threw away with the Son of God. Uh, but anyways, he tells them after going through all of that, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Don't be troubled over this fact. We've, we've, I've told you what's going to happen. <clears throat> and then he goes on in another place, said, neither, neither be afraid. We'll t- talk about that when we get to it. But anyways, uh, he's, uh, he's trying to strengthen, getting them, getting them ready for something, for the worst night they'll ever have in, have in their lives, watching the Son of God be tried and convicted of uh, nothing, lies, lies that were put up at his trial and accused him of being guilty of blaspheming so because he said that destroy this temple in three days I will be able to raise it up again because they were ignorant of the word and didn't know what it meant. I just thought, thought he was talking about if you destroy this temple, this earthly temple, I mean this physical temple here, temple in Jerusalem that took some 40 years to build and complete, that I'll build it back in three days. So they said he was guilty of blaspheming <coughs> and, and was guilty of being, needing to be crucified. And he goes on in uh, verse 2, said, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus said, Tell him what's going to be afterward. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. You know, what they still didn't realize it fully that Jesus was God and he was man. And it was evidenced by the fact that they keep on wanting to know, show us the Father. <laughs> and a little bit later here. <clears throat> but uh, if these mansions aren't there, then I wouldn't, wouldn't have told you so. The King James Version reads a little funny there. If, if in my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't true, in other words, I'd, I'd, I wouldn't have told you. So you have this to look forward to when you leave this life. See, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where there I go, you know, and the way you know. Now we get into the fact that they don't, they don't truly know who, who Christ is. So Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's a lot, lot said, in, said in this verse. We don't have time to, to really give it uh, justice, but just a, just a few comments. I am the way. Of course, Jesus is the way. He's the cure for the problem of sin. <laughs> Uh, man likes to think that he can work out things by himself, that he can, that he's uh, capable of doing, doing the same thing. Not only that, but they devise different ways in, in, in which they, they can obey the gospel. They come up with these different things, you know, salvation by faith, faith only, and this, that, and the other, but uh, not realizing that what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way. He also says, I'm the way, the truth. Uh, he was answered to man's ignorance. Man was ignorant about many things, still are. Ignorant means we don't know any better. But Jesus has answered to that problem. If we read and study this Bible, I, I, I spent two years in a cluster course going to school over, over in Huntsville uh, back in the 60s. I wouldn't take nothing for that. I only have a 12-year education in high school, but uh, finished high school, but there's a lot of things that I learned over there from studying the Bible that I've applied, not just as far as my spirituality is concerned, but as far as 
a lot of things concerned. And I think it helped, helped me in better understand a lot of things. This from studying the Bible. <coughs> I did find out a few things about preachers while I was there, Mark. I, <laughs> no, it was, uh, uh, well, shucks. No, it, it, this, this was years ago. It uh, was, uh, Some school of religion. I can't think of it now. It was a good, good school. They had a lot of, lot of good teachers. Rex, Rex Turner Sr., Rex Turner Jr. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I learned a lot of good things about preachers. <laughs> I was the only one in class. Huh? I was, I was, uh, <laughs> I, <clears throat> you know, I thought preachers were supposed to be more modest about the money they got. You know, back then I thought, well, you know, preacher ought to take what the church offers them. You know, not say I didn't know any better. <clears throat> so I was in my early thirties, I think. <laughs> but but uh, they they were sitting in there talking. <laughs> they, they they were sitting in there talking about you know what they could do to get more money. You know, well, this job over here, I, I, I'm going to have to go somewhere. I'm not making enough money. I'm going to have to go somewhere. And they're sitting there talking about that. And I thought, man, I thought this, thought this, was, yeah, I thought this was supposed to be a bunch of preachers, you know. <laughs> no, I know, I, I, I know better now. I learned, learned that well before I got out of class. <laughs> but I, uh, no, that was that was back then. I know much much better now. Didn't take me that long to learn, learn that, that like I said, preachers are they have families. They they have to support their families, and and too too many congregations want to undercut. They they want to pay them what they think they're worth, and and uh, not realizing they don't care that they've got families and. And the first thing you don't want to do is underpay your preacher where he has to get out and do some other work to, to get money. And uh, some of it may, may be illegitimate. I've, I've seen that over the years, too. Uh, heard of it happening. I had not seen it, but I've heard of it happening. Uh, but uh, if we, we need to check with the preacher, see what he needs to support his family and all, and, and uh, take care of it. It's the church's job. <coughs> but anyways, we'll get off of preachers. I thought y'all thought that might be interesting. <coughs> but I in, in, enjoyed those classes. Uh, and the only thing I didn't like about it was the amount of homework they gave, especially had had one it was 80, 83 year old at the time time I was there. Uh, I can't remember his name, but uh, he was a good good teacher. But but uh, he's going to do the book of John, and he made us do a uh, write a a full commentary on the book of John. Every verse had to be had to have an explanation, of the whole whole book. And uh, I didn't. I got a good good grade on it, but I like never got it done because trying to work, you know, and having to work some overtime, I expect you to work some overtime. It's hard hard to get all that took care of and take care of the things you had to do for your family and at home. <laughs> and I had a, one of the teachers we had was, I'm going to say this and I'll shut up, Winston Clark. You know Winston. Most, several of you here did, preached at Hobbs Street for years. Uh, only thing he done, he expect you to take notes in class. No tests, no nothing. But when Rex Turner Sr., he, uh, that's where I learned all the Roman emperors. We had to learn all the Roman emperors, the dates, dates that they came in, the dates, how long they reigned, when they left, and all that. And, of course, I'm, <coughs> I'm glad he did because you can, you can date 
most of the Bible, New Testament books by going with those. Uh, so there, four of them are mentioned in, in, uh, in the New Testament. Three are mentioned by name and one alluded to as the lion. Anybody know who the lion was? Who was spoken of as the, the lion? Don't worry, I don't, I, I don't expect you to know that unless you read it today or two ago, but Paul was. No, not Paul. Uh, Nero. Spoken of as the lion. So Nero's the one that had Paul's head chopped off. <clears throat> but let's get, let's get back to the lesson. Jesus said, I guess you can tell I'm killing time, trying to kill time. No, not really. I, I just thought, I'd like to throw out something that might be a little interesting, you know, occasionally. But uh, in getting, getting back to verse 14, Thomas says unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We were talking about that, weren't we? Then uh, the life, of course, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Somebody like to read that? First Corinthians 1. Okay, I don't think that's what I'm looking for. I think I wrote it down wrong. Well, anyways, <clears throat> uh, he is he is the life. He lives the life. The Bible tells us, you know, to to. Uh, To strive toward the goal of perfection. Who set the goal of perfection? Christ did, didn't he? Living a life without sin. Can we attain to that goal? No. Well, we can through the uh, becoming a child of God, being baptized in the life of Christ, which is in Christ that we, are, we take on the righteousness of God. And when we mess up, we fess up. Again, as Robert says, I like that term. And we continue, continue to ask God's forgiveness when we mess up. And we, we can attain, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 talks about us being uh, perfect in the eyes of God. That's hard, that's hard to imagine. But the, the strive, when it tells us to strive toward the goal of perfection, we know in, in life that we, if we set a goal, we don't want to set it way down here. We want to set it up high. And we may not ever reach that goal, but if we don't put the goal high, we're not going to strive toward the goal. We set it down here, and we reach it, you know, it may not amount to nothing. <coughs> we're, 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 we're done. But if we, if we put a, set a goal up here, then we, we have something to work toward. That's what he's talking about. We strive toward living the perfect life that Jesus lived, even though we can't do it. But we can still be accounted righteousness as God, take on the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. How do we get into Christ Jesus? We're baptized into Christ, aren't we? So Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the, to the Father but by him. Verse 7 said, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have not seen him. His own apostles have been with him for some three and a half years. And yet, they still don't know who he is. They don't know him like they should. They should have been studying him. Do we know God like we should? We have a... Have a God tells us about him. Don't the Old Testament tells us about God? Of course, the New Testament does too. God coming in the flesh. Man, you know, Christ in sinless was telling me, you know, right? I only speak the things that the Father told me to speak. It's not I 
but the Father in me. They, you would have thought over a period of three and a half years they would have realized that, but they didn't really, feel, really understand it fully until Christ ascended back to the Father. And then, you know, in New Testament talks about, you know, they remember such and such and that Jesus had said. <clears throat> of course, they had the Holy Spirit that was sent to guide them into all truth to and bring to their remembrance the things that they had been taught. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices thus. Philip, Philip's like me, he's kind of dense. Jesus done told him several times, you know. And in verse 7, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and henceforth you know him and have seen him. And yet Philip still asked the question, show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. Jesus says unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. You know, we... Of course, we have, we have the, the Bible to study. They didn't have the Bible to study. <clears throat> they didn't even have it written down. But they listened to Christ for three and a half years as he taught them. And yet they still, still didn't truly understand. They were looking more for a, a physical kingdom, looking for God, Christ to be their king and to drive out the Romans and, and, and be a great king like maybe like David was when he was on the throne in Jerusalem. So they weren't, they weren't accepting the fact that his kingdom was going to be a spiritual kingdom. They were still looking, looking for it to be a physical kingdom. <coughs> and Jesus, like I said, in verse 11 says, believe, thou that, believe, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. What does he mean? All right. That he was he was God, or God was in him, and he 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 needed uh, he needed to pay better more attention to the things that Jesus was teaching, but they were uh, their mind was more attached to the fact that he was going to be a physical king in a physical kingdom. <coughs> And if they had, had read and studied the Old Testament, especially the book of Daniel, points out things to us. Of course, they didn't. They should have probably had the writings of Daniel back then, but, but that would have been all they had was the Old Testament. The Old Testament spoke, spoke of Christ and, and had a lot, and pointed out a lot of uh, things about God. They should have known, should have known God. Yes. I've, I've often wondered, you know, can you really blame them for? Can you really blame them for, for thinking like this? I mean. No, I don't. I, I, I uh, I'm not, not. I don't mean to be blaming them, but pointing out the fact that they had, they had the, the evidence was in front of them. They were, their eyes were not open. Right. They weren't looking, looking for the right kind of evidence. Uh, and Jesus kept trying to drill it in, drill it in, drill it in, but it wasn't wasn't sinking in. I don't I don't think I would have did any better had I lived back then because, and uh, he had a pretty smart group of people. They were commons, common people, but uh, and that's who who Jesus. I guess I asked the question. I guess of everybody, you know, not. Uh, I right. mean. I, you, we we have the scripture, mm -hmm, right. you know, as as they did didn't, uh, they had they had the word in the flesh in front of them, and yet there still was that that thinking and the the mindset of you know this the, this is the way it's always happened before. We've always been sent a uh, a savior. We've always been sent a, somebody that's going to set us free. You know, we're we're in bondage with with Romans, the Rome uh, Roman Empire Empire. And uh, I, I guess, you know, we, we can see uh, through Scripture, we see Christ for who he is. 
But uh, here, you know, Christ is telling them to their face time and time again, and yet they still, they, they, they're thinking of that earthly kingdom of, right. of you know. I he, think that's what. Well, if you think about Paul, he was a very intellectual man. I mean, he said, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah he, I mean, his whole point was, I'm, I'm intellectual. And if anybody wants to say I'm a Jew, but look at me, I'm a Jew among, among, you know, I'm a better among everybody. But what was he doing? Persecuting Christians. Why? Because he thought that Christ was the Messiah because he wasn't coming to set up the earthly kingdom. If he was, then Paul would have said, hey, this is great. That's, that's him. But, but that's what I'm saying. <laughs> No, he thought. Yeah, he thought they were blasphemy. So, See, same, same thing with Paul. If Paul had studied the Old Testament, they had the Old Testament. <coughs> if he had, he had studied, studied the Old Testament, smart a fellow as he was, and uh, with no preformed opinions, he could probably figure everything out. Look, look at Daniel chapter 7 for just a minute. Verse 12 says, And as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, and their, yet their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. It's talking about the four world, four world empires, the, and the three beasts that were, that were uh, slain, but their lives, talking about prolonged, they were dead, but their lives were prolonged for a season at a time under the Roman Empire. They, the things that they contributed to the to the fullness of time were passed on to the Rome, under the Roman Empire. And this is uh, Daniel speaking, said, I saw in a night, night vision, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. What's he talking about there? The church. Yeah, they have a, uh, right. Came to the ancient, one like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. Now, where do you read about that in the New Testament? The ascension of Christ. What did Christ ascend into the heavens on? Cloud? What does it say here? He came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. Who is the ancient of days? No, that's God. That's God. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him. God gave him dominion and glory, a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Um, Daniel 2.44 says, In days of these kings, talking about the Roman kings, God of heaven has set up a kingdom 
which should never be destroyed. And it's, uh, would not be left to other people. And it would break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. The little stone that was made without hands starting out. And it smoked that image in, in chapter 2 upon his feet, which was partly clay and part, part, part iron. And it fell. The little stone grew into a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Never has been taken over by any, any nation or any group of people. Never will be. What's he talking about? Talking about the church. Kingdom of God here on earth. So there's, there's evidence that there that could have been used. Hey, look here. This guy's going back to heaven from whence he came. There it is right there. Daniel chapter 7. Talk about the kingdom which would never, never be destroyed. Go back to Daniel 240, 247. In the days of the Roman kings. And when you look at Luke chapter 2 and Luke chapter 3, both of them beginning, it talks about in those days. What days? In the days of the Roman emperors. God of heaven would set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That kingdom is the church. Of course, we know that the words kingdom and church are used interchangeably uh, throughout the New Testament, especially in Matthew 16, where it talks about, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So we, first he's going to build the church, then he calls it the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. <coughs> uh, Better get out of the book of Daniel and get back to John chapter 14. Verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. <coughs> this is a promise Christ is making making to the apostles, if you believe on me, you think I've done great works, you haven't seen anything. You're going to do greater works than these after I go unto my Father. What's he talking about? That's, that's true, but that's just for a short period of time. Those miracles and signs and wonders is to confirm the word. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, I think, verse 4, somewhere along there. But anyways, uh, what's happened down through the 20th centuries since Christ died upon the cross? Billions of souls have been saved. That's a pretty good work, isn't it? That's a greater work than Jesus done while he was here. He did what he could while he was here, but in, in, physical, in the physical form, in the physical body, he was limited to what he could do, but not spiritually, not with us, his children, doing the works. And that's what that points out the importance of us doing his work. If we don't do it, it don't get done. He's not coming back. He's not going to be crucified a second time for the world's sins. We got to take care of that far. He put the, we're his chosen vessels. We're supposed to have the gospel in our hearts to go out and teach it to others. And might I add, and uh, Brother Ecker to back this up, anybody else that's been to the jail Yo, ministry, Ronnie and others. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable teaching somebody, get involved in the jail ministry. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. 
you got a captive audience, not saying they might not question you, you know, about things. That's all right. It's good. Need to be questioned. Make you study harder. But get in, get involved in that. And it'll boost your confidence many, many times over. That first buzzer second. First one. But uh, that's, that's just uh, that's one of the things that I think he's talking about here. It says, uh, he makes two, uh, two things there that he'll give us. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. No. That he did. We're going to do the physical work, like you say, teach and preach and live our lives the way that we're supposed to do, be examples and, and do the things that we do now. He, he saw that, that, that we were created for that. Right. And what? But we won't, we won't obviously be able to do the miracles that he did, but we, we'll do the physical part. But what does, what does the Bible say about a man's soul? How important is he? Worth more than the world. Yeah, the, the, Worth the more than the world. And yet, one, one soul is worth that. What is billions of souls worth? Far more important than the miracles that Christ created while here on this earth. And that's not demeaning their importance, but he, he used those for a reason. And uh, to accomplish what he accomplished in order that we can do what we do today. And that's... That, I think, is, uh, is the works that he, he done and also the greater works that he did. As we said, he, uh, Christ couldn't be here in the human flesh. He was God. Came and made flesh. First John 1 John 1.14, he became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld him as the only begotten of the Son of God. So... Uh, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. <coughs> Does this mean it would be, could be appropriate, appropriate to pray in the name of Christ? I think it does. He's telling you, you ask anything in my name. Of course, he was talking to the apostles, the apostles back then. Now, this, this is not, a, not addressed to us. They, you know, far as far as miracles and all, they were able to perform miracles. And they could pray to God. God would, uh, not necessarily pray to God, but if they needed some strength, uh, then ask, ask God's help. That's what he's telling me. Ask, ask my help. I'll help you. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. You know, today, which is more important, love or faith for the world? People say we're saved by faith alone. What does that mean? What about love? Actually, what they're doing is putting, putting faith above love, isn't it? Can a man be saved without love in his heart? Even a man not going to have a whole lot of... Uh, Love converting others if he didn't have love for his fellow man is not not going to say some can't. I guess if feller had a slick enough tongue and and didn't mind telling a few fibs here and there, he might be able to do that. But it cost him dearly. <clears throat> but uh, you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter that He may abide with you forever. About the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, see I wrote down here 1 Corinthians 13 13 what does that say Same love. 
And now by the faith, hope, and hope and love. And, grace and grace love. Of these is love. Right. Grace of these is love. Can't put faith above love. Even the, even the spirit of truth whom, whom uh, he's going to have sent, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Okay. I believe that's the second buzz read.
If everybody be seated, we'll, we'll get started. Visit with us this morning. I notice we do have some visitors. We appreciate your presence and invite you, like to invite you back every time you have an opportunity. If you're looking for a church, we we think that you'll find this a, a very friendly church. If you don't, well, let let me know. I'll be a little friendlier. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, we're glad glad to have our visitors. Uh, got several still on the sick and prayer list here. Doug Brown. Had infection in his foot from a nail that he stuck in it a week or so ago, and uh, Wednesday had to scrape the infection out. He done had one one surgery on it, and and it uh, still still get infection in it, so they had to redo that uh, Wednesday. Uh, they're checking the cultures to see what needs to be done. Uh, after we get through here, we want to have a special prayer on those. Uh, part because it's, they're going to have to do some special work on his leg to try to get blood down to that foot in order to heal it. And if not, if he can't do that, then he'll, he'll lose his foot. So I'm going to be sure to keep him in our prayers. Allison Hogan continues to have various tests, but is doing much better. Daniel Bates is scheduled to have hernia surgery Tuesday. Is that in Athens, Daniel? What time? Oh. Oh, okay. Ruby Phillips has had COVID this week. She is doing much better. Nancy Swanner had COVID last week and has completely recovered. Joyce Connor had COVID this week and is doing much better. John Hartley has requested prayers for his sister, Sheila Hartley. She has breast cancer and is going through chemo. There will be a bridal shower for Kurt Bates and, and Reagan Southers April 2nd. See Bulletin and uh, group for FB group for res registration info. Good Timers, the senior group, will be headed, headed north to Ardmore Tuesday to dine at Mildred's Restaurant. A sign up list is in the foyer. Bus leaves Tanner at 1045. <clears throat> you would, let's have. Special prayer for Doug and for Daniel. Daniel's having surgery this week as well. Father, we come before your throne thanking you for all the wonderful things that you do for us each day of our lives. We're thankful, Father, for the privilege of being here. We're living in a country where, which allows that, Father, for the privilege of being here to worship you without fear of being molested from outside sources. And Father, we pray that we might always have this privilege. But even if we're to lose it, Father, help us to have the faith to <clears throat> continue to worship you in, in spite of what, whatever may come. That we need to keep you first in our lives, Father. We uh, thank you so much for the avenue of prayer, and we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. And, Father, this time especially we ask a special prayer for all our sick, Father, but it's special for, for uh, Doug and his foot. We pray that uh, doctors will be able to get blood supply down to his foot where his foot can heal up and he won't, won't lose it. Father, we realize the importance of having, having all our limbs that you put on this body when we came into this world. Father, we earnestly pray that you would help him that the foot might get well. And Father, be with Daniel. With the surgery he's having Tuesday, we pray that doctors would be successful in, in uh, taking care of the hernia he has, and it, he might soon recover from that and maybe have no more problems with it. Father, help us each day to do your will. Forgive us when we fall short. For Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We'll open up with uh, Open My Heart, this song. It's not in the songbook, but we do have the PowerPoint. Get a 
hit here. Open my heart to what you know so I can stretch, so I can grow. My feelings toss me to and fro. Open my heart to what you know. Open my eyes to what you see. To understand what I should be. My feelings get the best of me. Open my eyes to what you see. Open my ears to what you hear. So I can keep you very near. My feelings make it so unclear. Open my ears to what you hear. So open my heart to what you know, so I can stretch, so I can grow. My feelings toss me to and fro. Open my heart to what you know. Open my heart to what you know. Now, Zach Trotter, lead us in opening prayer. Let us bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here today to worship you, to sing praises to you, and hear more of your word. Father, we pray that as we study your word that we will open our hearts, open our minds to your word, and be more like you, to be drawn closer to you. Father, as Christians, as your children, we are so thankful that we have Jesus to save us from our sins. We are so thankful that he died on the cross for our sins. Father, we know that you want everyone to go to heaven. So we pray that we can be mindful to show others what you mean to us in our hearts and in our minds as our Savior. Father, we pray for those that are not here this morning. Father, we pray that those that are hurting, those that are in the hospital and having treatments, Father, we pray that you will comfort them and strengthen them so that they can come back and be with us to worship you. Father, we're so thankful that we have each other as brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage us, to encourage us all to be more like you. Father, we know that as all the struggles that we have individually, that we can grow together as Christians to be more like you. Father, we pray as we worship you this morning that we will bring everything that we have, all of our attention, all of our focus on you. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, let's sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, 
What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first crime to final dread, Jesus demands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand We are about to pray for the Lord's Supper. If anyone here may be visiting or perhaps doesn't have one of these containers, please raise your hand and uh, someone will make one available to you. If not, let's go ahead and uh, pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, Father, we are so grateful for the so many blessings that you bestow on us each and every time. On this first, first, first day of the week, we're commanded, Father, to make memory of your death, one that reminds us of all the sacrifices, Father, that you made for each and every one of us on the cross. Please bless this bread and please allow us to partake it in a manner that will, that will be well-pleasing to thee. In Christ's name we ask you. Amen. Let us pray for the fruit of the vine. Our grateful Father, please bless this fruit of the vine that 
remind each and every one of us that are partaking of this element, Father, that this represents the blood that your Son, Jesus Christ, shed on the cross of Calgary. We ask you, Father, to allow us to think of the great favor and love that was shown for each and every one of us and allow us to partake this in the word and manner. In Christ's name we ask you. Amen. Uh, if anyone has not made his contribution, there is a trade to the back, and at this point, uh, as a matter of convenience, we are going to pray for the offerings. Dear God, we thank you so much, Father, for the so many blessings that you give us each and every day for the country that we live in and all the blessings that exist in this country, Father. We ask you to allow our heart and our mind, Father, to give back a portion of our earnings so the church is able to pay for its obligation public, publicly and privately. And we ask you, Father, that if anyone among us, Father, is not able to contribute to this offering this morning, Father, that you bless them in the same manner. Forgive us, Father, for your shortcomings. In Christ's name we ask you. Amen. Number nine, a wonderful savior. We'll sing the first, second, and last of this song. A wonderful savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Before the lesson today, let's sing number 415. Invite you to stand as we sing this song. Mm -hmm. 
More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn, more of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches in glory all his own, more of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming Prince of Peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Be seated. I will be reading John eleven thirty through 35. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house had came, who had come forgot her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and she went out full, followed her saying she is gone to the tomb to weep there when mary came with jesus was and saw him she fell down at his feet saying to him lord if you have been here my brother would not have died therefore jesus saw her weeping and the and the jews who had came with her weeping she groaned in the spirit and was trou troubled, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Good morning. Clayton, wonderful job. Always does a wonderful job, and all our young men do. Let me t turn my lapel on. Uh, you can turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. That'll be our text for today. We'll look at a few before then, but we'll be looking at 18 verses there in 1 Kings 19. Good to see everybody today. Good to be able to be here. Who brought winter back? Goodness gracious. I mean, we do it every year. I get excited, you know, when it warms up a little bit and we get outside and we bring all the summer stu uh, stuff out and we begin to work in the yard and then it hits again. It fools me every year. Am I the only one? No. <laughs> uh, we're blessed. We're blessed to be children of God. We're blessed to have the freedom to gather here like this. It doesn't matter if the sun is shining or if it's cold, whatever. And it's good to be able to see you. 
it's good to be able to be together, and it's encouraging. I'm going to... I typed out of my notes to start off with this joke, but uh, now I'm starting to have second thoughts. So uh, I gave you uh, balls a couple weeks ago, but I didn't hand out anything today for that very reason. So you can't throw anything at me, okay? All right, here it is. Psychology students uh, were uh, in their psychology class in the University of Chicago. And the, uh, the instructor came in, the professor came in, and he was uh, trying to talk about emotions. That's what we've been talking about lately, so that's what he was talking about. And emotional extremes, to be specific. And so he's trying to get the class engaged, and so he was asking them questions. And, and so he asked uh, one uh, girl from Iowa, what is the opposite of joy? And she said, well, that would be sadness. And he said, that's very, very good, very good job. And then he looked over at a guy from uh, Florida, and he said, okay, what is the opposite of depression? And the guy from Florida said, well, that would be elation. And he said, good job. And then he looked at a guy from uh, Texas, and he said, what is the opposite of woe? And the guy from Texas said, well, I reckon the opposite of woe would be giddy up. <laughs> all right. I'll be here all day. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to talk about sadness today. We're going to talk about um, depression just a little bit, and I don't claim to know everything about that, but uh, obviously being sad, being depressed is not that simple and certainly not funny at all, but it is a huge problem in our society today. The overwhelming majority of Americans deal with this at some point. Uh, that's some of the surveys, statistics I looked at, but to be honest with you, we all deal with it. We all deal with sadness. There's no doubt about that. I think we all deal with some form of depression sooner or later, and there's different kinds of depression. Uh, we're not going to go into all of that right now, but 20% of U.S. teenagers face depression. Think about that. That's almost a quarter. And when I saw that, I was just absolutely amazed. But then again, when you think about it, uh, this number has increased dramatically in the last decade. And you think about what kind of world we are giving them today to where there's no absolutes to where we say that moral relativism is a thing. There's no absolute. There's no truth. Uh, and where we're even confused about basic things like gender and things of that nature. Uh, where almost 60% of divorces or marriages end in divorce. And so there's no wonder why there's so many teenagers dealing with depression today. It's not teenagers alone. 29.6 billion American, uh, Americans, almost 10% of the population deal with depression. And I'm talking about more than, of course, just sadness. This is one that uh, really took me by surprise. 50,000 people daily check into clinics in the U.S. looking for help for depression. And so we all know that this is a problem. We know it because we see it in the world around us. We work with people sometimes uh, that deal with this. Unfortunately, we have it in our families because none of us like to see this. Uh, and a lot of us deal, uh, deal with it, of course, ourselves. And so there's different kinds of depression. I'm not going to go into all of that. And, and they change the terms uh, constantly. Uh, but like clinical depression has to do with having a chemical imbalance. And so if you have that, then there are drugs that, that are required. I have high blood pressure, and so I have to take medicine for that. That's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's just the way that it is. And if you have clinical depression, if you have a chemical imbalance, and you have to take medication for that, there's absolutely nothing to be embarrassed about when it comes to that. That's just the way that it is. But I will say this, most people that deal with sadness and depression do not need medication. The vast majority do not. They simply need to know how to get help. And so we're going to look at this today. Uh, we've been in this series for about two months now, and we're going to, uh, going to end it today. I actually had a few more lessons, but I think it's run its course. I'm ready to start doing something different, and then we might go back and talk about emotions some other time. Uh, but we've been talking about it, I guess, since the very beginning of the year. Well, we talked about grace first, then we got on this. Uh, but emotions, they're not a bad thing. We struggle with them so very often, and that's because uh, Satan uses things against us. 
But emotions are not given to us by Satan. They're given to us by God. We know that. And we looked at this passage here and we started talking about how there's a number of different ways that, that we're made in the image of God, emotions just being one of them. And so we can look at God and we can look at Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, and we see that they have emotions as well. God the Father does as well. We looked at some passages about that before. And so the very fact that they have these various emotions, and yet, of course, without sin tells us, and, and that they gave these emotions to us, tells us that if we can get a hold and a handle on these emotions and use them for His glory and also for our good. And so the, the thing is to get a hold of these emotions. So obviously the emotion we're talking about today is sadness. And so did Jesus ever experience sadness? Doesn't it make a difference when we're thinking about God in the flesh, when we're talking about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, doesn't it make a difference to know that He dealt with sadness in many occasions? And so there in John chapter 11, of course, He had found out about one of His friends. He had been asked to come and to heal Lazarus, but He did not. And one reason why is so the glory of God could be seen in him and healing him and raising him actually from the dead. But Lazarus passes away and, and the sisters Mary and Martha are just beside themselves with grief. So Jesus shows up on the scene and Jesus is grieved and he is sad because he has lost a friend. But not only for that reason, he's also sad because he sees a friend, Mary, specifically Mary, that is dealing with sadness and grief because of her brother passing. And it says in John chapter 11 and verse 33 that he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And that was right after he saw Mary in her uh, mourning. And so that reminds us that, that we are saddened, of course, when we lose somebody uh, that we love, but we're also saddened when we see people that we love in our life, whether it be a, a family member or a friend or a brother or sister in Christ, uh, that is sad, that is going maybe through depression, that has lost a loved one, and our hearts go out to them. And so he was sad. And then it's, of course, two verses later, verse 35, uh, that Clayton read so capably a minute ago that it says, Jesus wept. So Jesus feels sadness. And then we see in, in Matthew chapter 14, we see that, uh, we know that John the Baptist went to Herod, Antipas. And there he was telling him that it was inappropriate, that it was wrong to divorce his wife. And not only to divorce his wife, but to take on his sister-in-law of all people as a second wife, uh, Herodias. And think about that. I mean, how gross is that? But uh, <laughs> anyway, so he does this in a public way, and Herod doesn't like that too much. And so literally, John lost his head because of this. And so when that news traveled back to Jesus, Jesus, it says in Matthew chapter 14, and in verse 13, it says, it says that he got into a boat and he went away to be by himself. And it wasn't long until the crowd caught up with him because of who he is, because of his fame and everything, because of the miracles, because of his great teachings. But the point is, is that he was saddened about this news. That was uh, his cousin, that was his friend, and it made him sad. So he just got into a boat, away from the apostles, away from everybody else, just to be by himself. Sometimes we just need to be by ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I'm a people person. I love people, and I love to be in social situations. I just, I love interacting with people and talking to people, but sometimes I just want to be by myself. And when I want to be by myself, people think there's something wrong, because I'm usually not. In fact, my wife will sometimes ask me, are you okay if I ever stop talking? <laughs> uh, and I want to be alone, then she'll think something's wrong, but sometimes we just need that. And then there's another occasion there in Luke chapter 19 where Jesus is looking over Jerusalem. And he is saddened, it says, about Jerusalem. And it talks about him weeping over Jerusalem. And the, the reason why is because of their state, of their spiritual state. They have overall rejected him. Of course, there's people that are following him. But overall, they're rejecting him. And he knows that if they reject him, there is no hope. Brethren, do we know that? There is no hope without Jesus Christ in our life as being our Lord and Savior, as following Him, belonging to Him, being faithful to Him. There is no hope, and He knows that. 
So he's saddened because of their state. Not only that, but he knows, of course, knowing all things, he knows that the Roman occupation is going to occur in AD 70, just a few years after this, and that everything is going to be destroyed in that city, and that beautiful temple is going to be destroyed, the walls of the city are going to be destroyed, and that it will be a massacre. And there's thousands upon thousands that would be killed. And so Jesus wept over Jerusalem. So we see that Jesus has sadness. He is saddened over loved ones that have passed on. He's saddened when he sees friends dealing with this. And so we experience sadness as well. We're going to do a case study today. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're going to look at Elijah. I just wanted to look at Jesus first, God in the flesh, to, to show, of course, that he had this emotion and dealt with that. I think we all know that. But to see how to deal with this emotion of sadness and depression, I wanted us to look at Elijah because Elijah was a prophet of God, a great man, and yet God loved him and he cared for him and he helped him overcome this emotion in his life that he was struggling with. And so we're going to look at some classic symptoms of depression that Elijah had. And then after we look at that, we're going to look at how Jesus gave him uh, the, pro or the solution to his problem. So some symptoms of depression looking at Elijah. First of all, he was fearful. He experienced fear in his life. So let's look at verses 1 through 3. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also if I do not make your life as the life of the one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. He was fearful. He ran for his life. And you might be thinking, well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense because after all, you have this crazy woman, Jezebel. Jezebel had killed people before. She was out of her mind. That is the king's wife. She is the queen. Ahab is the king. He's crazy too. And so they're wicked. They're crazy. They're after him. And so, of course, he's fearful. So you think, well, there's nothing unusual about that. But actually there is because what is bizarre is what just happened before this. And if you don't back up and look at chapter 18, but you have the great victory at Mount Carmel. You remember that? Where Elijah said, okay, let's find out whose God is the real God. What we'll do is we'll make the, these altars and we'll lay sacrifices on the altar and we will, uh, and this is the prophets of Baal, by the way, and you call for your God to send down fire, I'll call to Jehovah God to send down fire, and whichever one does is the one true God. And so you remember how that took place and how they're praying, this 450 prophets of Baal, and he's confronting them. He's the only one, and he's fearless because they're, uh, they're confronting their God. They're praying, please, God, uh, send down fire, and it's not happening. And here this man, Elijah, is one person, and he's defying them. You know, he's mocking them. He's making fun of them. He's saying, where's your God at? You know, what, is your God out of town? Is he on a, on a journey? Is he on a trip or something? Maybe your God is sleeping. You know, maybe he needs to be woke up. It's funny to read that because he's literally mocking 450 prophets at this time. And then he prays for fire to be sent down from Jehovah God after, of course, drowning, just completely drenching the sacrifice with water. And, of course, God sends down fire, devours the sacrifice, devour, uh, devours the altar, all the water and everything around it. And then what does he do? Then he commands that all those 450 prophets of Baal be taken, be seized, and he takes them down to the brook and he executes every last one of them. Does that sound like a man that's fearful? Absolutely not. You say, why in the world would he be fearful? Well, the more I read about it and, and the more I experience life, I see that it seems like emotions a lot of times there's doubt and sometimes there's depression. There was a guy when I was a kid that was a preacher that I thought the world of. I mean, he was so dynamic. I was so used to, to seeing a preacher get up, and I'm not bad-mouthing this, but I was so used to a preacher getting up and just stand, standing still and, and practically reading everything and would put you to sleep. 
And like I said, I'm not, I'm not downing if somebody preaches like that, but that's what I was used to. This guy, man, he was just dynamic. And he got his point across, and I loved him. And it surprised me as a child to find out that he lost his job as a preacher preaching for this big congregation, and that he also had all kinds of family problems. And it wasn't until later on in life that I found out what the reason was. He dealt with depression. And he would be good for a while when he was on his medication for it and when things were going good. And then all of a sudden he would get off of that. And he needed that medicine. And he ended up dying several years ago as a pretty young man, actually. And so this is not... It doesn't mean if you deal with fear in your life, if you deal with some depression, if, if you deal with some sadness, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a lack of faith in God. It doesn't mean that you are uh, a less of a person or less of a Christian because of that, because we all deal with this and some more than others. We're all fearful sometimes. So that's the first symptom. The second one is that he had suicidal tendencies, and we see that in verse 4. Verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. Does that sound like a man of God? And said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life for I'm no better than my father. What he's talking about not only is his father, but he's talking about his fathers before him. He's talking about prophets before them, before him and how they were wicked. And he's saying that... Uh, the reason why he's saying, I'm no better than them, is because of his doubt, because of his fear, because he's struggling with this depression, with this sadness, and, and he's, I think he's attributing that to a lack of faith. He's saying, God, I'm no better than all the wicked ones because of this. And that's just not so, and we'll look at that in just a moment. But if you think about it, sometimes we, when we get down and we deal with depression, some people that deal with that will go through times to where they don't see their self-worth. They don't think that they're worth a whole lot. And that's just not the case. And they need to be told differently. Let's look at a third thing. A third symptom of depression that Elijah had was that he had excessive tiredness. We see that in, in verse 5 in the first part. It says that he laid down and he slept under a broom tree. You say, well, what's the big deal? We all sleep. Every single scholar that I've ever read about this says that this was not just taking a nap, that more than likely this is sleeping literally for days. And the indication there is that if you read, you see that an angel comes up to him, wakes him up, gives him some food, and then he goes back to sleep, and he continues to sleep, and the angel lets him do that, and he comes back to him. And so the indication there is that he's sleeping for a long period of time. Now that's a classic symptom of sadness and depression. And I think we probably all know that. Sometimes not, not wanting to get out of bed, not wanting to start the day, laying in bed all day long, sleeping a lot. And so Elijah had that as well. A fourth symptom of depression is that he felt all alone. And we see that in verse 9 and 10, but we also see it repeated in verse 14. Beginning with verse 9. And there he went into a cave... And he spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, notice, I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. I'm all alone. Nobody else is here. Later on, he's going to tell them that the fact of the matter is, is there's 7,000 other people like you, but he doesn't know this at the time. And yes, he was alone in the sense that he was the only one there before those prophets, but he feels so alone. I'm the only one, God. And that's a classic sign of depression and sadness, to feel like nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody understands the feelings that I have. Nobody understands... Uh, what I've been going through in my life and what I've had to deal with. Sometimes we might feel like that even with our work, that nobody, nobody else is doing anything. I'm having to do it all, and maybe you're having to do more than your share, but that's never the case that you do absolutely everything. And so we see here that Elijah is dealing with sadness, and I would say even depression. Now this is the thing I want you to hear first of all this morning, is that God does not leave him there. 
God does not say, Elijah, what's wrong with you? Won't you pull yourself together? Get a hold of yourself? He doesn't say, well, I can't use a man like this. No, God cares. And I think that we need to hear that. I think that we need to understand that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done in your life, no matter what you've gone through, God cares. And He loves you. He loves every single one of us. And He doesn't want you to feel that way. It's normal to feel sadness to a certain point, but He doesn't want you to feel like you're all alone. He doesn't want you to feel like nobody else cares, and He certainly doesn't want you to get to the point where you want to die. And so He wants to help. So notice how He helps this man, and I think that will be something that can help us out as well as we deal with sadness and maybe depression in our life. And so first of all, God provided him with what he needed. And doesn't he always? He gives us all things pertaining to life and godliness. God gives us what we need. God is good, is he not? He gives us what we need. And so he needed rest and nourishment. So notice in verses 5 through 7. It says, Then, then he lay and slept under a broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a, uh, a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Sometimes all we need is just a little R&R, right? Sometimes all we need is just a little bit of rest and nourishment. I can remember in my 20s, I had a full-time job at, the, at this time. I had a part-time job. I was going to school part-time, and I had very young kids. And I thought that I was going to have a nervous breakdown. I really did. I mean, there was a period of time there where I can't remember sleeping more than three or four hours a night, sometimes not even that much. And there was a point where I had to get away, and I did. And I went to uh, one of the Carolinas, and I got away for uh, about a half a week. But I, I can remember taking a shower and standing in that shower for probably an hour and a half straight. And I have never felt so relaxed in all of my life. I finally could relax. I had no responsibilities. And I went to bed and I slept literally for two or three days because I was just drained. I was physically drained, I was emotionally drained, I was mentally drained, I was spiritually drained, and I needed to rest. There's, there's nothing to be ashamed of if you get to that point in your life. In fact, you need that. You need to kind of reboot, as we say, and just refresh. Sometimes we get overwhelmed with our work, and sometimes we just need some time off. Sometimes we get overwhelmed with life, do we not? Life can be hard. It may be sickness, it may be disease, maybe somebody in your family that's suffering with some kind of disease, going through treatments or something like that. It may be uh, just working too much and we can get overwhelmed, so sometimes we just need to rest. And so that's one of the things, he let them rest. He went and gave them some food and then the angel left and let them rest some more. Second thing that he did here is that God got him to renew his relationship with him. That's so very important. Notice what it says here in verse 8. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, Horeb is called the mountain of God, but actually what Horeb is is a mountain range. And the highest peak of Horeb is Mount Sinai. Does that ring a bell? Mount Sinai, of course, is the place where God made his covenant not with Abraham, but with Abraham's descendants, with the children of Israel, gave the law there. And so he took them to the place where it all began, to where he made that covenant with the people to renew that relationship with him. This is so very important because we can get so wrapped up in our jobs sometimes, in our occupations, sometimes just in life in general, that we don't, we don't have the intention on doing this, nor do we even realize it's happening sometimes, and we get further and further and further away from God. We're not able or we do not gather with the saints to worship Him. We don't get that encouragement that comes from being here together. We maybe are not reading. We're not applying things to our life. We're not, our prayer life is not what it should be. And before you know it, you're not in a good place. And part of the reason why is because of your relationship with God is not what it should be and what he wants it to be. 
So I want to encourage you to make your relationship with God close. If, if you've gone away from Him a little bit, repent of that. Make a change and come back to Him. But it's not just our relationship with God, but it's also with one another. That's part of what we're doing here today. We come here to worship God, but we come here because we love one another and because we encourage one another and we challenge one another and we're there for one another. A study conducted at... Duke University, with this is 4,000 adults, concluded this. Listen to this. Attendance at a house of worship is related to lower rates of depression and anxiety. If you want to lower your stress, it's saying come and worship God with the saints. Be together with God's people and worship Him. You say, what does that have to do with anything? God said so and God knows what's best, right? Because we love each other here. We, we're not just looking out for ourselves, we're looking out for others' interests. Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4 says. Right? University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, published a study uh, that concluded this. It said, shared laughter signals that we see the world in the same way, boosting our sense of connection. Being together, laughing together, crying together. Romans 12, 15 says rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. So laughing and crying and being together, going through the highs and lows of, of life, connect us as people and help us and encourage us and make us stronger. That's why we need this. Andrew Newberg, the director of clinical medicine of the University of Pittsburgh. Notice none of these universities... And these people that I'm reading are from Christian universities. So notice that. He says this, When people are engaged in spiritual pursuits, they lose the concern over self. Did you hear that? When people are concerned about spiritual and engage themselves in spiritual pursuits, they're less concerned over self. Amen? It's not just about us. God knows that. Later on in that study, he says, and I quote, prayer and meditation lower the risk of depression and heart disease and improve immune function. God knows that, does he not? God knows that. That's why he wants us to come together and be together. It's not so we can cross it off a list. It's not just to ease our conscience. It's not because this is what I've always done because I've been brought up this way. It's because God knows what's best. We need each other. We need this. Not only to say, God, we love you, we praise you, thank you for all that you do, but to help one another out. And it does. It helps me. I hope it helps you as well. And I believe with all my heart when we come, and we are coming with a good heart, with the intention of worshiping God and helping each other out, that we all benefit from it. And we'll be blessed better from that. And so let me read, you know this, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Oh, that's just that commandment saying, you better not miss a Sunday. No, it's not. There's a reason for it. And that is to help us get to heaven. Amen? Amen. Try to be here. Try to be here. Because that's God's design. And you will be blessed as a result. A third thing is that he tells him his problem. He has Elijah open up about it. In verse 9 and 10, which we read, uh, verse 9 says, There he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, God knows all things. God knows why he's there. In fact, God even sent him there. So what in the world is he doing? He's giving him a tender invitation to express his feelings. And we all know that psychologists and psychiatrists back many, many years ago came to the conclusion that that is healthy for us, right? To open up and to talk to each other. You need that. I need that. We all need those people in our life that we can talk to, that we can confide in, the right people that are gonna, is going to give advice and sometimes won't even say a word, just sit there and listen to us, talk to them. We need that. A fourth thing that he has Elijah do to help with his sadness is he, he speaks truth 
to Elijah. And we just need to hear truth sometimes. In verse 18, it says, yet I have reserved seven. Remember, he thinks, I'm all alone in this God. And God says, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. God is saying, you need to know the truth. There's 7,000 other people that are just like you, you know. Sometimes I think that when we are struggling and, and maybe dealing with sadness and depression and we do feel all alone, we, we kind of lie to ourselves and we can deceive ourselves. And we need somebody that loves us in our life that says that's not the case. Nobody cares. No, that's not the case. People do. We need people that care, right? I'm in this all alone. No, you're not. We need people to speak truth into our life and encourage us as God did Elijah. Fifth and last thing that he did to help Elijah out is he puts him to work. He puts him to work. Verse 15 through 17. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nipshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as, as prophet in your place. That's a lot of hard names. <laughs> but he's basically saying, get to work, okay? I've let you rest. I've, let, I've left you. I've give you, uh, given you nourishment. I've encouraged you. I've speak truth into your life. Now, I want you to go get busy. You've got work to do. Famous psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Menninger was approached with this about how do you having a nervous breakdown and how with depression, what he said, and I quote, look up, look out, cross the track, and help her, encourage not Often when we depression, with him. that. You can start that. Focus on him and focus on others. It's amazing that works. Focus on how to help him and you feel not God out of to the truth of God and look at how have given Jesus, 
no turning back, I'll follow him.